Good evening. This is John Early here. Um, it's always strange to talk to myself on the computer, uh, not knowing who's there, who's out there and what's going on. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about something I thought I would never, ever talk about, and that's the use of staples uh, in foot and ankle surgery. I'll get my, let me see if I've got control here. I'll get my disclaimer out of the way. I'm a, I am a devout designer and user of plates and screws, have been all my uh, medical career, but I've never been afraid of uh, innovation that makes mechanical sense. I was an engineer uh, before I uh, went to medical school. And unfortunately for me, looking at and playing with this product, I had nothing to do with the creation of this product, though I sure wish I had. So look at the general principles of uh, bone healing as we talk about when we're trying to use fixation of whatever kind. We want to create maximum compression at the healing site. We always talk about that, but it's not really maximum compression we want. We won't want a tremendous amount of force. It's living tissue. We want an area of coverage. We want to get a compression over the broadest area possible, but not too much. And the hard part is, is there's no way to really measure compression, but we know that the capillary pressure is about 30 millimeters of mercury at maximum. Anything more than that tends to restrict blood flow, and we need the blood flow at our point of fusion in order to get healing. We know that whatever we use, whatever construct, screws, uh, plates, uh, <clears throat> pins, wires, that must resist the forces around it. That's always the problem. We want to get motion out of the way so it doesn't disturb the bone healing process. Things we worry about, the moment arm, or the force that's acting on our structures a distance away from the point of fixation. That's a multiplier that can create a tremendous amount of stress that's bad for healing. Shear forces, they're forces that are essentially parallel to the surfaces that we're trying to heal or fuse. All we, what we do know is all those forces that act parallel to the healing service can be problematic. We like multiple fixation points. We want to distribute the load around this area. In other words, get a greater area of compression without overloading a particular living tissue bone uh, that can create a potential problem. Again, bone is alive. Healing involves both the formation of new bone and the resorption of old bone at the same time. And that's probably the biggest problem we have. We can't predict how much bone will be removed and how fast new bone will be put there. And so, it becomes a time-dependent issue with many things on healing. So why plates and screws? I basically, my career has been around plates and screws. I was trained, highly trained in trauma and then did foot and ankle at Harborview. And for me, it was all about the mechanics. It's the effect of the, the static and dynamic forces on the healing of bone. You want to control the bad forces and you want to promote the good forces. So what is bone like? Bone likes stability. It hates the movement between the healing ends because it disrupts the bridging, the ability of the microtubules to connect, the ability of the cells to cross the area. Anything that creates, a, uh, I guess, a swing bridge or a rope bridge is problematic. What we do know and what they taught us out of, out of uh, Russia and Elizarov is it does like axial loading compression. Even dynamic, even a little bit of swing force in the in the plane of the healing motion is good for it. Everything else is bad for it, all other motions. So we wanna, and when we're doing the sta stability of our structure, we wanna eliminate anything that rotates, slides, or micro motion outside of the axial plane. It'll accept some axial plane motion, but it really likes compression. All of those other forces will lead to non-union. So what has that done? Well, over the uh, decades I've practiced, it's created a world of specialty plates. We've gone from various sizes of one-third tubular plates to all kinds of shapes and sizes, places where holes are for compression, for angles, uh, to multiple fixation, and they're designed to fix most situations. The problem with just about every plate is it's designed to fit the normal contours of bone. Unfortunately, very rarely do we actually get the normal or fix something. We've got to deal with around it. So it involves 
finding the right plate for that particular situation. And I don't know of any company that has every possible plate shape and formation to fit every screw construct you may want to use to stabilize something. Locking screws are there to prevent toggle or micro motion between the screw and the plate, also to stiffen it for pullout issues. Most of the time we're doing fixation with plate, you have to have at least two points of fixation in the bone to create stability. A single plate, a single screw in a, in a bone is, in my mind, just like a staple. Uh, you've got one point and it still can rotate around it um, to do that. So compression is a static issue with plates. We can get compression by slotted holes or other tricks we can do by eccentrically loading the screws, but you're going to get the Compression at time zero is the maximum compression you're going to get. And most of that is directly under the plate. It tends to expand out depending on where the distraction forces are. If the plate's on top of a foot and the foot's in a weight bearing position or plantar flex, it's just right there. That's why some people talk about plantar plating in order to try and get compression across. But we want to maximize compression. That's why you'll see independent screws sometimes outside of the plate plane to try and maximize that area. So one other thing is we all like thin plates, but we have to deal with some thickness because the positioning of the plate also matters. Is it perpendicular or parallel to the major forces against it? The strength of a plate is not necessarily the thickness of the plate, but it is the, is the height or the dimension of the plate that is against the force acting on it. So a thin plate on top of a foot is problematic because it's just the thickness of the plate, whereas a plate that may be a centimeter long on the side of the foot has that strength of that length to the third power. So in plate, plate positioning is also important. So what's wrong with plates? We just talked about some of it. The strengths of the plate can also be a weakness. Trying to deal with distorted anatomy. As you start to reshape a plate, you actually weaken the metal contours of it. You break some of the microstructures uh, especially if you bend it more than once. That, that creates potential problems to do that. Soft tissue restrictions to position. What's going on with the soft tissues? Is there scarring? Has there been damage to it? Or is it uh, the plate position you desire for fixation around significant neurovascular structures that are in the way? The size of the plate. Some of these bones are small in the foot. To get a number of screws in there, to get it across and make it fit, sometimes difficult. Uh, other anatomies like tendons are in the way. And so the foot bones are small, not enough real estate to sometimes stabilize the things depending on the plate system that you have that are used. And I've uh, a number of manufacturers available, not necessarily for every case, but there are certain plates that are in or certain manufacturers that I use because of the size and the way they fit for that foot or that particular knee that may not be in another manufacturer. So it's a lot of different things you got to remember when using plates. Staples, for the, this is probably the first time I've really ever used staples since I was uh, a resident. They were classically the U-shaped metal. You could place them almost anywhere, but it was like putting in a paper clip. They could rotate around uh, those edges. There wasn't a whole lot of sheer control. You'd have to throw in a lot of staples to sort of to sort of do that. Two point fixation always a problem. It's a problem with a plate. It's a problem with a staple. Um, and then the compression issues. They've gotten better at it, but it's all about the metal. Even nitinol uh, to do that. You get compression, but it's still a single screw with a plate crossing it and a screw on the other side is is essentially what you could do that. So. What's the big deal now? It's really, for me, it's the keel. It, it's, that's much more so than, than the nitinol or the particular shape of the staple. The nitinol gives the staple the best dynamic compression that any metal can give from that standpoint. It essentially at, reacts to, to changes in the bone over time so that as the resorption of bone and the laydown of bone happens, you're still going to get some dynamic compression past time zero that you may not have in the plate. The plate and screws cannot adjust to the changes in the bone uh, stresses over time. <clears throat> so the keel, the keel to me, it crosses the healing interface parallel to the compression forces generated by the tines. This essentially puts a, 
a lock between the two bones. Since it's crossing it, that those bones really can't shift at that point. It's similar to using a, a key on a, on, a, uh, on a gear that's on a shaft or placing a dowel uh, of bone in between uh, a fusion site to minimize that ability for the micro motion to occur. So the keel really helps to eliminate that. It's a direct bridge between the healing cortices. It also offers some stiffness to the crossbar for greater strength, which is always important because that's the area where it has to resist the, uh, the major forces of a moment arm to do that. So, oops, I'm sorry. So, how does the keel lock do it? Just as I was talking about, being between both bones in the same area, it doesn't allow the rotational area at that point. You have to have a significant moment arm distal to that to help it move. So it makes it even stiffer than many plate constructs from that standpoint. And that's what we're looking for in trying to get something to heal. So in many ways, when they do, it has plate-like stability in a staple. The keel geometry crosses the bones. You've got the uh, tines there that give it compression. So you can see on this on this chart here, the rotational stability um, with the keel lock, you know, twice as much as many of the other uh, <clears throat> staples as well as uh, plate issues. So what makes it nice is it still has those properties that you're looking for in a plate, plus a little bit more, and it's easy to do. You don't need as big an exposure, so you could put uh, these in sensitive areas. You don't need as much uh, bone real estate to get a couple screws in to place it apart. The keel makes up for an awful lot of that. So it's simple and fast to go in uh, to do that, can really speed up the time when you're dealing with significant issues in the midfoot. Also a nice low profile. So the nitinol implants, as uh, you've seen, uh, <clears throat> through Crossroads has a, has a uh, significant uh, stable of them to do. But the keel lock is really, for me, is, is the one that really sort of catches my eye and, and helps with many things that I do. They've got plates, not for the keel lock, with their other screws that can sort of add to what a keel lock does. You can see the relative stability. But again, you got to have more real estate to put the plate in than you do to have the, the keel lock. So, you can get a little more stability using a regular staple and a plate, but the key lock significantly brings it more than just a staple alone. So it really makes a difference for me. Issue, does it take up room uh, in the bone or is, it really, or is it creating a problem from the standpoint of uh, losing real estate? Now, it takes up less than cross screws uh, at wood from the standpoint of using 4.0. So the issue is, is not really does it get in the way, but does it stop those those motions that create problems with healing. So how do you get the keel engaged with bone? This isn't something that we drill. You'll see in the, uh, the <clears throat> demonstration we have at near the end that it essentially is a uh, impactor that will create the pathway pushing the uh, cortical bone, but basically compacting the bone at the edge in order to give it more rigidity at the place of the keel. And you can see here in this cross section, what the keel essentially does, it creates a lock between those two bones. And so it's about spacing it in that area to do. Again, looking at biomechanical testing, common constructs we use in the midfoot for all of them, whether it's cross screws, plates, plate and a screw, to do that versus a staple. You can see, yeah, at one end, the, the, the staple uh, being the being thing. Most of what I've done, all my plates and screws and doing that, but getting to a keel lock actually gets me above that with less real estate, uh, which is what's probably got me interested in trying it and working with it in the first place. So what does it mean for people like me who are platers? It really isn't the end of the plate dynasty. It's just an added tool that we can use to help when the constructs that we're looking for don't really accommodate the plates we have. We'll always need the plate to span an unstable area where you, where you don't have cortical bone on bone contact. The keel doesn't, doesn't work in a grafted area or a 
highly cancellous unstable area. It needs cortical bone to make that uh, area where it doesn't, where it locks down the shear forces. Now, you know, plates also for large, to control large forces. But I find even that, if it's spanning multiple joints, I find better control or better issues spanning the individual joints with separate plates than trying to use one large plate to control significant number of joints. So it helps, uh, it, in my opinion, using the keel lock is a huge help in revisions, especially when you're dealing with uh, implants that you have to remove because of either, either failure to heal or fracture of the implants. You've got holes, you've got less real estate to work with. So trying to find a place where you can lock down those things, the, the keel lock is tremendously helpful. Uh, in that thing. And it prevents a new way of thinking in how to deal with small areas, difficult non-unions, uh, or answers that we've, we've had trouble getting plates to deal with in the past. And that's where I first started using them, and that's where it's been most helpful to me. So what I would recommend, if, if you're interested in trying these, you try it on a difficult area. You know, try the navicular cuneiform fusions that have been bugging you in the past. Get it down because you can get this plate or this, uh, I'm sorry, get this staple right down at the plantar aspect of the naviculocuneiform joint and really get that moment arm to help get your compression through that so that you can place it appropriately uh, without having to worry about the tibialis anterior tendon. Talonavicular fusions, it, it does a nice compression through there. Calcaneal cuboid so that you don't interfere with the perineal tendons. Any place where a plate won't fit or a plate hole configuration not appropriate for the needs, depending on the manufacturer that you rely on to have your plates there. One of the things that I, impressed me a lot was just the many of the reps or, or the demonstrations or you know when we actually had meetings where you could go to uh, dealing with the uh, foam block test kit where they've got the foam blocks you're putting a regular staple in, you'll see, you'll see the motion that's there. Putting one of these key locks in, it's impressive how tight if you can make that construct with just one staple. Two in a 90 degree angle makes it significantly better to do that. It, it, it's, you know, we're tactile individuals as orthopedic surgeons. Play with it, see what it is. So let's look at a couple of the um, cases that, that I did fairly early on. This is a a young woman, a 25-year-old, had CMT, old club foot, um, increasing varus because of subtalar rise. She had a uh, Taylor fracture, body fracture neck uh, that was uh, put back together in a, you know, it's a deformed talus to begin with. Arthritis set in, significant issues, and then the CMT didn't help with the uh, progressive weakness she was having. So not a lot of real estate to get everything back together. So in this sense, trying to get a uh, essentially a triple arthrodesis done around her, creating some stability. The keel locks are here, both elevating the first uh, metatarsal to bring the foot back down, as well as the calcaneal cuboid joint, placing screws uh, in the uh, talonavicular and subtalar. Now, you know, in retrospect, yeah, I could have thrown another uh, keel lock in the uh, lateral uh, aspect of the tail and avicular, uh, but in all honesty, we ran out of them at the time. I only had two to use, and I picked the other two joints to, to use in the first place. So always uh, another good lesson to me is know how many you have before you start putting them in. But it, despite my worry about the tail and avicular joint, you saw that six weeks, and here we are at four months. She's weight-bearing um, to uh, to this without any without any significant problems at all, whether it's the first uh, TMT that you see solidly healed, the calcaneal cuboid, there was enough stability to help the talonavicular and subtalar along. So, you know, this was where I started with these and uh, progressed on from there. Uh, this is another gentleman, a 52 year, 57 year old gentleman who uh, had a significant issue uh, with posterior tibial tendinopathy failed a number of years ago, uh, didn't like the options that were given to him by a variety of surgeons, and so just kept going until it was essentially almost coming off of underneath his ankle, as you could see. 
Lucky for us, he really had very little instability of the ankle, but it was now about putting the foot back on underneath to try and make it stable. You can do triple arthrodesis a number of ways. Uh, I have uh, moved away from a lot of calcaneal cuboid fusions doing just essential double, um, do it with screws or plates uh, as can be. In this particular fashion, we use screws for the subtalar joint. I use two keel locks for the tail and navicular joint and a plate to bring the first uh, TNT joint down to a more normal position to restore some of the stability in his arch. Um, this is at four months. Uh, and again, I was quite impressed with how fast I would get a, a good solid union uh, at a joint uh, using just the keel locks without any screws in place. Uh, it was sort of disheartening to, uh, a little bit to see how well the um, keel lock would do versus what I'm used to with screws. <clears throat> Again, this is where we talk about the difficult things or the non-unions. Uh, this was a 53-year-old uh, uh, individual who was status post hind foot, mid foot realignment infusion. Again, due to a very unstable foot progressively over time with some arthritis. This is where a uh, big plate was used medially to go from the navicular to the metatarsal and try and control that whole area. Uh, in my particular practice, the navicular cuneiform joint has been one of the harder joints to get to heal. This individual, now about a year out, still having midfoot pain and swelling uh, to the point where uh, eventually they were breaking the screws at the navicular cuneiform joint. This was uh, seen again by CT scan. So in order to help with the pain, we took out the old hardware. We shifted the uh, calcaneus medially through an osteotomy and then used two keel locks to, after debriding out the navicular cuneiform joint, to bring it down into a better position for medial column fusion. And again, bringing that bottom keel lock down to the inferior aspect of the uh, navicular cuneiform joint is something I've never really been able to do well uh, with a plate and then getting the second one up in the higher area. And you can see even at six weeks post-op, uh, a significant improvement in the bony apposition in that area as well as its uh, uh, you know, glassy appearance as healing is going on while the osteotomy of the uh, calcaneus is still sort of visual. At four months, by the time the calcaneal osteotomy is completely healed up, I've got a satisfactory pain-free condition at the navicular cuneiform joint also. The, the one reason I picked the keel lock was because the plate uh, there prior had significantly changed the bone. You had the screw holes to deal with to avoid also. This allowed me to work around those areas and stabilize it. So that's why I say it's a good tool even for revisions. So, you know, you can, it doesn't mean you have to use it exclusively in areas. You can use it in combinations. This is another patient that had uh, a mid-column fusion uh, elsewhere, um, and they were having pain, and the implants were removed because it was felt that the implants were part of the pain. Well, this is now two and a half years out. Uh, you can still see the, in the CT scan the screw holes, and essentially uh, the significant navicular cuneiform arthritis that is, that is there, as well as uh, incomplete union of the first uh, TMT. The cysts and the, and the previous uh, plating and screw holes making things a little bit difficult. So again, in combination with the plates, a plate for the first TMT to stabilize that in realignment, as well as uh, two keel locks for the navicular-cuneiform uh, joint creates a satisfactory area uh, for, for stability. So you can use these to work around the plates uh, instead of trying to do a big long plate, which I've sort of moved away from because I want to control each joint independently. But again, as a standalone, it works quite well. This has really been, as you can see, my go-to for the navicular-cuneiform joint. Here's a patient with arthritis, a CT scan shows it's significant between bo at both the middle and medial cuneiform navicular joint areas. Not an easy place to get a bunch of plate and screws. Uh, through that, I was able to do this through two small incisions, one inferior to get to the bottom of the 
uh, medial cuneiform and navicular and one, one superior to get the lateral, getting that whole construct down together. So let's look quickly here at a little bit of a uh, demonstration of the keel lock. Got going, there's 18 and 20 millimeter sizes. There's one end. This is the keel lock guide. Important to put that T right at the joint surface where you want the uh, keel to go. I'd go ahead and drill these at, at least 20 millimeters. You want to make sure these pins go in deep so that they're not in the way of impacting the keel lock. This is the guide that goes on. That screw hole there can be used to have a handle to hold it down. This is not something you drill. The idea is to compress that bone in there. You saw the, the, uh, the impactor. It's set up so that the keel lock will fit in there. You impact this in, and you have to make sure those pins are down. Otherwise, they'll hold the impactor from bottoming out. This is a handle you can use to help unscrew this device to pull the impactor out, much better than trying to wiggle it to do that. The impactor comes out, that comes off. The keel lock goes in, twists off, and then you impact it into place to bring it down. Uh, it, you, this comes off very easily uh, to do that and really gets a tight fit. So you can see the key to the whole thing is getting the guide where you want that keel to be. And it has to be in areas where there's cortical bone on cortical bone. Anything you leave open around the keel uh, defeats the purpose of the keel itself. So that's the one caveat you really have to pay attention to. So successful adoption of using the keel staple. The healing don't change. You're still trying to do the same thing. This just offers you a smaller package to get the stability or the decrease in strain and stress from your healing surface. The staple position is as important now as, it, as the plate position is as far as resisting the forces that act against healing. You still have to worry about the moment arm, things that are distal to it. How do you get compression across your surface as much as possible, whether you use two keels or a keel and a regular staple or a keel and a plate, it doesn't matter. The idea is you're trying to get the largest compression area to get the best fusion you can. Um, I think even with a keel, rarely can you get away with only one staple in a mobile complex, even if it's a screw to stabilize something. It really is about making the best complex you can to stabilize that area. I think two staples are best out of plane across the seg segment to use. So, and then this is the disclaimer, of course, for the company uh, indications and risks for all the staples that we use. And that will conclude the, the portion of the talk that's pre-programmed, uh, open now for any questions that people may have. <clears throat> okay, I mean, first easy question, how much room does the keel take up? It's uh, 20 millimeters from time to time, about two millimeters thick, you can impact it in. So it's a 20 millimeter span, uh, well, from time to time. So the keel takes up approximately uh, 10 to 12 millimeters in, in width. It's a millimeter and a half thick um, to do that. So it, it, the idea is it can't be too wide because it'll interfere with the tines as they come in. That's why you don't have staples that are much smaller than an 18 millimeter. And then I've got one here. Um, let's see, when doing a navicular fusion, do you ever fuse the second as well? Yeah, as, as in that one uh, picture there. I'll, I'll fuse whatever I think is unstable. Um, sometimes you'll see the inner cuneiform be unstable also, but it's about checking the joints. If the joint's healthy, um, then I don't want to bother uh, to do that. But if I see significant amount of instability there between the medial and middle, yes, I'll do it. If they all work as a unit, then I'll probably deal with them as a unit and not necessarily do the inner cuneiform areas. So that actually takes care of another question somebody asked about intercuneiform. But I guess, you know, those issues are always be, I'm looking at all the joints in the foot, and as I'm looking to get stability, 
If there's something that's unstable, you bet I'm going to add it to to what I thought I was going to do. If the ligament ta- if the ligaments are holding it as a unit, especially in the midfoot, I really don't necessarily want to uh, interfere with those any more than I do because when you start taking joint spaces out, you do start changing the dynamics of every other uh, bone around there. So I, if the ones that are arthritic, I go after. The ones that are unstable, I go after. The ones that are stable, I tend to leave them alone. So it, that's the best way I look at it from that standpoint. Does the staple compress with this keel? Yes, the tines of the staple will move towards the keel. The keel does not move from that standpoint. So really what, what's happening is, is you, you set it up to compress at the top of the staple and the keel is there. What the tines do are start to, or will move in over time distal to the staple. So it actually will keep that compressive area down deeper than the keel itself. Unlike a plate, at time zero, that's what you have. But as you get healing, things change. You're not going to necessarily continue the compression all the way down the length of the screw. The, the, the metal over time tends to do that because it's going to tend to still compress in until it completely gets back to its elastic normal shape. Um, some of that's no guts, no glory. There's a question here. Have I or would I consider using this in a lapidus or second TMT? I guess in that one patient, I did use it when I was using a dorsiflexion osteotomy, sort of like a, a lapidus. Um, I probably, you know, I would make sure that I've had one down in the distal aspect to do it. So if I did it, it'd be two. I'm probably just too chicken to do it right now. The second, um, the second, the biggest problem, I would probably still add a screw to it if I did that, um, basically because the problem is, is getting that plantar force to stop and, and the positioning, the resistance of it moving out. So I haven't gone to those issues. Uh, at some point, I might, but I started using the staple for areas I wasn't happy with in, 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 the, in my normal practice of fixation. The places that I'm happy working right now you know, it's hard to change when something that you have works for you, but it's not necessarily wrong to try it in, in that area. The keel interacting joint, uh, well, I mean, you're, at that point, it's not really a joint. So it's interacting with both of the edges that you're trying to fuse. So what it essentially does is it does not allow the two fusion surfaces to move independently against each other. And that's really what we're trying to do when we're trying to get rid of the shear forces. The more that the micro motion that occurs, the more movement between those two areas, the more disruption to the healing process that is going on. So the more you can do that, whether it's cross screws, whether it's a keel, the better you can. I mean, with cross screws, we talk about that intersection has to be as far apart as possible to make it work. Half the time, we don't do a very good job, and our cross screws are sometimes right next to each other, so we really have a point fixation. The keel adds to that um, in the sense that it, it really locks down the cortexes. But again, you've got to have cortex to make it work. You don't, you don't do that in an area where you put cancellous graft, where the keel has no effect at all. So let's see. Um, I sort of begged and pleaded and got to uh, use this product probably six months ago, seven months ago was maybe when I uh, had a chance to start using it. Um, and it's just the fact that how fast people were comfortable. I mean, that's what most of us use as a gauge to do we really have a solid fusion? Does it really look, look good? despite what x-rays show us, is about the patient's pain on weight bearing or doing things to it. And I was impressed at how fast people felt comfortable when I would put these in. Okay, so I'm scrolling through. Did I lose anything here? Um, let's see, so the keel interact. Uh, so how, how long, okay. Problem, do I have any problems thus far uh, pearls to reduce the issues that you've had. 
the issues, uh, the problems have been the same problems I've had with plates when you're doing revisions is finding bone that's stiff enough to give you to give you your your fixation both uh, using the nitinol to compress and the keel to use. Uh, it's just finding the right position. Sometimes it's once you get the plate out, you actually have to make a small incision elsewhere to find decent bone to put your fixation in. And that's that's usually, that's why I say, this is a way, this is sort of a get out of a jail card. You've taken a plate out and you're going, the bone where that plate was, there's nothing left to fix. You've got to make an incision somewhere else or get, or, or get a plate in. This sort of gets some stability away from where the problem is uh, in a much smaller uh, surface area. So that's why I, I like keeping this around when I do have a problem. I'm going to learn how to use it more and more uh, on, as I see problems where either from my own work or somebody else's work, I'm not getting the fusion I want. The learning curve, no, it's, uh, it really isn't a learning curve. It's really straightforward. If you put the guide where the marker is at the joint um, and aim appropriately, yeah, you do use a C-arm because the last thing you want to do is put a tine, let's say at the navicular, put a tine into the tail and navicular joint or aim where you wind up with a tine in a joint as opposed to the bone. The midfoot, all these bones have funny shapes. The medial cuneiform is kidney shaped. It's a lot thicker at the bottom than it is at the top. So it's knowing those anatomic issues uh, and how you align it that make a difference on, on how it goes in and do that. So the learning curve is the same for screws and plates from that standpoint. Uh, but it actually is real easy if you just pay attention to the guide, put the pins in, uh, put that keel place, the, the keel falls right into it and you impact it. It's a whole lot easier than trying to deal with a plate and screw. Um, you know, the indications, uh, what indications is really, it's like plates, it's what plates do you use. It's surgeon's choice for the indications. If you think, I, it's for me, it's a problem um, in the sense that I've got a problem joint where I don't have a good answer for the plates I'm comfortable with in those positions. I tend to use it. Will I use it more as, it, as we go along? Time will tell. Um, it's hard, like I said, it's hard to change things that are comfortable and working for you uh, to do that. But if it, if it does a better job, yeah, I may move to it. Uh, it it'll kill me to have to get, give up plates completely. So I don't see that. I'm just too old to make that big of a change. I'll let the young guys figure that out. Um, there's a question here about visualizing the joint and x-rays or CT, it's actually many times a lot easier than a plate. It doesn't take up nearly that much room um, to, to be able to, to see the joint. You want to see perpendicular to the placement of the, uh, of the uh, staple or keel lock to see what it is. And, you know, the, the, in the plane of the plate, you can't see that area. The keel lock takes up much, a much smaller area, so it's more visible from that standpoint uh, to do that. So it's been, it's been really helpful to sort of watch those, uh, those healing areas. If you don't have any more questions, Dr. Early, um, thank you so much for taking time this evening and, and sharing this with us. You're welcome. Um, and yes, if, if there's questions, if you can uh, get through the crossroads reps, they'll get it to me. And, I'll try to answer it as best I can. But the, the key thing is try it on something hard um, where you've got bone that, that, that the plate or your normal technique won't fit. I think you'll be impressed with how it works. Great, thank you. And thank you to Crossroads for sponsoring our webinar this evening. We appreciate it. All right, thank you all and have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night.